Good morning. While Casey's getting settled, I'm going to go ahead and get started. I do have two things for announcements that I want to draw to your attention, and they're both on the insert in your bulletin. The first is that we need greeters, ushers, and liturgists. Please. We need some help so that the rotation can be maybe once a month instead of being up here every week. And also the Kentucky Project, the sentence says, watch for collection baskets by the doors in the month of October, which means next week is the end of October, so it's the last time to bring anything in. Sherry? Good morning. Good morning. First of all, I want to say a big thank you to those who prayed, those who volunteered. We had an excellent time at Trunk or Treat. Um, no rain, although next year I will pray that the wind is down a little bit. But uh, we had 56 children registered, and um, of course they came with their families, and we had a great time. We had, I believe, 11 trunks. So the Lord um, answered my prayers even more than what I had asked. So I just appreciate you all for that and for the ministry that you enabled us to do and the outreach you enabled us to have to families in the community. And I also wanted to tell you November 3rd, which is a Wednesday, um, we are having a new um, outreach event and it's um, Blessing of the Pets. And so we invite... Um, it's going to happen at 6 p.m. on a Wednesday night between our Kingdom Kids and our youth program. And um, we're going to have everyone in the back parking lot. All pets are welcome, just as long as they're on a leash or secured in a carrier. Um, and we're going to pray for them and give out some treats and hopefully touch some folks in the community that maybe we haven't reached before. Um, so I'd invite you to come to that with your pet and also to invite your friends or neighbors who you think might enjoy that. We've gathered here together to praise God, so please spend some time settling in as we listen to the prelude.
Good morning. Good morning. Please join me in the call to worship. All that we are is a gift from God. The earth is the Lord's and all that is in it. All that we have is a gift from God. The world and those who live in it. There are no words to describe the wonders of God's creation. For God has founded it on the seas. Rejoice as we join together in praise for God's great gifts. God established it on the rivers. Please join with me in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for this day and for the privilege to worship you in this place. Let this be a time of refuge, free of distractions, that we may truly worship you. In Jesus' name, amen. Please join me in the opening hymn. It is This Is My Father's World on page six of the hymnal. join me in the affirmation of faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please join me in the prayer of confession. Gracious God, you are the giver of every good and perfect gift. You give us our talents, our freedom, and our financial resources. We struggle to give back to you from these gifts. We often worry that these gifts are not enough, that we must hold on to them for ourselves and for our family. Remind us again that you have blessed us to be a blessing to others and free us for more generous giving. Forgive us, O oh God, for all our sins as we continue to pray in silence. In Jesus' name, amen. While God knows our sin, God also hears our cries. In our sin, God still reaches out to forgive and restore us. Having confessed our sins, 
rejoice in forgiveness through Christ, and live in God's love. Amen. Sherry, it's time for the children's message. Good morning, guys. So I told you earlier that I brought something um, this morning. I've brought this before. You know what kind of animal this is? What do you think? Uh, I see that you know. It's a turtle, right? Are tur turtles fast or slow? Slow, yep, you bet. So I brought this turtle to remind me that God says we're supposed to be slow to do something. And I'm going to share that verse with you in a moment. But, you know, usually do we like to do things fast and get them done? Or do we like to go like a turtle, slow, slow? Usually people want to go fast. But God says there's something we're to be slow to do. And it's in the book of James in the Bible, and it says this. Know this, my beloved brothers and sisters. Let every person be quick to hear. So that's so quick is fast, right? So how many ears do we have? We have two ears, right? And we're supposed to be quick to listen. But listen, it says slow to speak. How many mouths do we have? <laughs> Just one, right? We have two ears to listen and one mouth. And God says we're supposed to be slow to speak and slow to anger, slow to get mad or angry. And when we do that, because God says it doesn't produce the good things, the righteousness of God, when we're quick to get angry and mad and to speak. Maybe we say things that are unkind. But... Um, when you see a turtle, remember, God says be quick to listen, but be slow like the turtle to speak and to get angry. All right? Let's pray and ask God to help us to remember that. Lord, thank you so much for the turtle that can remind us that it's not always bad to be slow. Some things we need to be slow in, like slow to speak and slow to be angry. Help us to remember that, Lord, and to be quick to listen. In Jesus' name, amen. Our mission moment this morning was from discipleship, and Miss Betsy was supposed to speak, and she did speak at the first service, but then she went home and didn't teach Sunday school. Pray for Miss Betsy's health because this is the first time in probably 40 years that she's missed Sunday school. So may the Lord be with Miss Betsy this morning. She asked me to say a few words about discipleship. And I just wanted to remind you that they have Sunday school for all ages, preschool up through adults. And there are two different adult classes. Kim's is mainly Bible, lessons, Bible reading, scripture, that kind of thing. And then Jeff's is a video, and right now it's talking more about the New Testament and helping understand some of the background of the, of the New Testament. They've also started up their programs like Kingdom Kids and Youth Group, and all of those are going on. I wanted so, to remind you that they have Sunday school, uh, for so all go ahead. ages, preschool <laughs> up through adults, and there are two different adult classes. Kim's is mainly Bible, Wes's Bible. Okay, the video audio is playing, but can you get it to work? If not, I can always talk more. <laughs> Uh, 
Okay, discipleship, when you hear discipleship, the first thing you think of is Sunday school. So I am talking about Sunday school. We have it for children all the way through adults. Somebody, Kim will be talking about the adult Sunday school. Uh, of course, we didn't have it all last year, and we're looking forward to starting up this year again. We will also be having children's church. The kids will go up for the children's message and then go out for children's church during the service. Then on Wednesday nights, we have offerings for children through youth, our four-year-old through fifth grade. We have Kingdom Kids from 5 to 6 p.m. And on uh, we then followed up at 6.15 to 7.30, we have a program for our youth, um, sixth grade and up. So it's a great time on Wednesday nights. In discipleship, we also cover um, two big events for the children of the church and community. Um, in October, we do trunk or treat, um, which is a safe way of you know, doing a trick or treat um, without the scary stuff. And then in the spring, we also do the Easter egg extravaganza, um, which brings lots of kids and people to the church for um, Easter egg hunt. Okay, and I uh, teach adult Sunday school, actually in this classroom, 115. I think uh, this, uh, for next six weeks, we're gonna talk about a compassionate Jesus. Also, Jeff, uh, Pastor Jeff, has an adult uh, Sunday school class also. I'm not sure what his subject is, but he will be in the adult lounge. Um, so there are two great classes. Ours is more Bible-based. Jeff sometimes is video and talk, and that's sort of what uh, ours is, a lot of discussion in, in Bible verses. So come and join us. It's, it's a really good time to have some fellowship with the adults of the church. Discipleship also organized the blessing of the backpacks that we had in August to pray for everybody going back to school, students, teachers, and faculty. And we gave them little tags for their backpacks to know that their backpack was blessed and that the members of our church were praying for them and loving them throughout the school year. I am the uh, leader of the uh, group of two ladies, Lynn Apple and uh, Melanie Bates. We take care of the library, make sure the books are in order. We uh, have books that are out. We send uh, a note to the, those that need to bring their books back. We make sure that the cards are in the books. Uh, we also uh, have story hour on, in the summertime and we have a, a group of uh, teachers that will, and helpers, that will uh, have the story hour. We've been having it for quite a long time. And, uh, but mainly we make sure that, and hope that, that people will come and use the library we have. And don't forget on Wednesday night using Zoom, there's a woman's adult Bible study. And then on Thursday night, we have our adult Bible study. We've moved up to room 203, 205. Thank you. You know, a lot of people say that uh, God works in mysterious ways. And uh, a few years ago when we were looking for a pastor, uh, before he came, somebody came and asked me, well, on his first Sunday, can the choir sing? And I think it was in the summer. I said, sure, we can get them to sing. So we had sung a song earlier that year, and I thought to take the pressure off the choir, we'd just sing one we did earlier in the year. We didn't know who this person was who was coming to our church, so it just kind of worked out that way. So uh, we all know who we have for a pastor now, and the song I picked out is one of my favorites. It's called, He is the Rock. I'll let you figure that out. Thank you. 
No, we need to calm back down again. <laughs> Let us pray for those on the prayer list and those in our hearts. God of hope, there are many in our midst and in our community who are hurting. Some are suffering from physical ailments, some from the loss of a loved one. Some are suffering from mental, spiritual, or emotional distress, while some are suffering from financial difficulties or job problems. There are those who are suffering in so many other ways. The world seems to offer little hope. You offer hope. You offer us joy. We take a moment of silence to lift to you the concerns in our hearts and minds. The Lord Jesus Christ gave us the pattern for all prayer, and so we gladly say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Luke 12, 48 reminds us, from everyone who has been given much, much will be demanded. And from the one who has been entrusted with much, much more will be asked. Let us be faithful stewards of our time, talent, and money that God has provided.
Let's pray. Father, thank you for all the ways you bless us every day. All that we have comes from you. Please accept our gifts and respond to your grace and use them to further your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, we're going to sing our praise song next. Um, they're in alphabetical order in your praise books that are in your pews. Uh, the, it's How Majestic Is Your Name. Please be the seated. Old I'm sorry. <laughs> the Old Testament reading is from Malachi chapter 3, verses 6 through 12. I, the Lord, do not change, so you, the descendants of Jacob, are not destroyed. Ever since the time of your ancestors, you have turned away from my decrees and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord Almighty. But you ask, how are we to return? Will a mere mortal rob God? Yet you rob me. But you ask, how are we re robbing you? In tithes and offerings. You are under a curse, your whole nation, because you are robbing me. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will be not room enough for, to store it. I will prevent pests from devouring your crops, and the vines in your fields will not drop their fruit before it is ripe, says the Lord Almighty. Then all the nations will call you blessed, for yours will be a delightful land, says the Lord Almighty. Our New Testament lesson comes from Select the passages, chapter 8 and 9 in 2 Corinthians. And now, brothers and sisters, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. In the midst of a very severe trial, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. For I testify that they gave as much as they were able, and even beyond their ability. Entirely on their own, they urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in his service to the Lord's people. And they exceeded our expectations. They gave themselves first of all to the Lord, and then by the will of God also to us. So we urged Titus, just as he had earlier made a beginning, to bring also to completion this act of grace on your part. But since you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in complete earnestness, and in the love we have kindled in you, see that you also excel in this grace of giving. I am not commanding you, but I want to test the sincerity of your love by comparing it with the earnestness of others. Moving on to chapter 9. There is no need for me to write to you about this service to the Lord's people, for I know your eagerness to help, and I have been boasting about it to the Macedonians, telling them since last year you here in Ikea were ready to give your enthusiasm was stirred most of them to action. But I am sending the brothers in order that our boasting about you in this matter should not prove hollow, but that you may be ready, as I said you would be. For if Macedonians come with me and find you unprepared, we 
not to say anything about you, would be ashamed of having been so confident. So I thought it necessary to urge the brothers to visit you in advance and finish the arrangements for the generous gift you had promised. Then it'll be ready as a generous gift, not as one grudgingly given. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly, so that at all things at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. As it is written, they have freely scattered their gifts to the poor, their righteousness endures forever. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. This service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of the Lord's people, but is also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. Because of the service by which you have proved yourselves, others will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ and for your generosity in sharing with them and with everyone else. And in their prayers for you, their hearts will go out to you because of the surpassing grace God has given you. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. Thanks be to God for his word to us today. Before we pray, I'd like to take a moment here and explain a little bit about why I said I'd preach this morning. Over 25 years ago, I was at a stewardship workshop, and the leader said that the pastor, any paid staff, should never be the people to ask for the money. As a staff person here and before at the Jeanette Church, that always made me happy because then I didn't feel like I had to ask, talk about tithing and stuff. Most of you remember the Pony Express, Consecration Sunday, and Step Up campaign. The programs were all designed to take the pressure off of the minister to ask for money during the stewardship campaigns. Pony Express was a member-driven program, and I remember we were at the Jeanette Church when they did it, and we were in skits and did things like that. Consecration Sunday was a pulpit exchange so that the pastor that came here would preach about money to us, and Jeff would go, or at that time it was Dennis, would go to the other church and preach to them about giving money. They didn't have to talk to their own congregation. The Step Up campaign was another member-driven campaign, and I'll revisit that campaign in a few minutes. I also know that our Book of Order says that any session member should be able to step in whenever the pastor isn't here. With all that in mind, I prayed about telling Jeff I would cover things this morning. And again, God showed his sense of humor and encouraged me to step out of my comfort zone. And I am clearly out of my comfort zone this morning. Do you remember when I did the children's messages? I turned my back to you. I'd rather you see their faces. Then whenever I retired, I became liturgist. And the only time I felt comfortable in the pulpit is when I leave vacation Bible school, because then I'd be carry on. I recognize, as well as all of you will soon recognize, that I am not a preacher. Let's pray. God, one of the greatest gifts that you have shared with us is your word. Open our hearts and minds to the message found in these passages. Help us to hear with anticipation what you have to say and give us a sense of urgency to share it with others. Amen. Sorry, it's allergy season again. We are in the middle of our stewardship campaign for 2022. And there's a misconception about stewardship campaigns. There's an attitude that pastors might be motivated to preach on giving because of their own selfish concern, or maybe about the budget, or maybe a building program. We need to realize that stewardship is not fundraising. It's basic discipleship. Each one of us must come to understand that giving is not about doing our duty. To truly yield to God's ownership of our possessions, we must evaluate carefully what may, the, 
may be the most telling evidence of our stewardship, the part we give. We need to decide how much to give. Many see giving as a burden, but Paul tells us that God loves a cheerful giver. Now that doesn't mean that you're smiling and humming as you put your money into the envelope or when the plate comes around, you're laughing and putting it in. That means that in your heart, you are comfortable with what you are giving. Consider your offering as a ministry to others. It's a good way to give your testimony. It's an expression of the gospel. We avoid talking about money from the pulpit because it's awkward and uncomfortable. But Jesus talks about money more than he talked about heaven and hell. Eleven of the thirty parables are about finances. So talking about money is biblical. You should have gotten a trifle by now. They've been out and they also came in the mail. And on the back, you can see the outline of what our messages have been. This morning, the topic is our giving. And you'll also see that all the sermons are from the same passages in 2 Corinthians 8 and 9. So, of course, that means that you should be hearing some overlap between what Reverend Rock has been preaching and about what I'm talking about this morning. You also should have received a letter from the session about the stewardship campaign. And in this letter, it says, and I quote, how you will contribute financially in the coming year as we advance the kingdom of God here on earth as Level Green Presbyterian Church. You're being asked to make a decision. COVID has really upset our apple carts. The last two years have been filled with uncertainty. Uncertainty for you, uncertainty for your family, and uncertainty here at Level Green Church. As we try to put our apples back in the cart, we need to remember that giving is a deeply personal indicator of our spiritual maturity as well as our love for God. Giving is a relational issue with God. With that being said, tithing is something that I have struggled with all of my life, so I'm not using myself as an example of someone who tithes. But as someone that knows in her heart that she should tithe, my problem is getting my head to match my heart. Let me go back to our Old Testament reading. Malachi tells us that we are robbing God in our tithes and offerings. That's harsh. We're robbing God, but it's true. God tells us to bring our whole tithe. If you have the Bible that has the titles before each of the sections, like our Pew Bible does, you'll find that this morning's reading, the title is Breaking Covenant by Withholding Ties. We are breaking covenant with God. Malachi also says, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. In the Old Testament days, God's people offered the best they had to God. They offered the first fruits of their flocks, their crops, and their income. Abraham was the first to tithe. It's not a modern church idea. In the Old Testament, there were three tithes. Two of them were taken yearly, and once was taken every third year. Dr. Charles Rarey estimates that the tithes came to about 22%. On top of that, they had free will offerings. Can you imagine they did all of that without a stewardship campaign? Their offerings provided for the Levites who took care of the temple and for the poor. We are opening our hearts to others when we bring our offering to God, and we are opening, opening our hearts to heaven when we tithe. Malachi tells us that God promises to open the floodgates of heaven and pour blessings on us. He will multiply what we offer to him. Paul says the same thing. What Paul doesn't say that is that if we, got, ugh, that if we tithe, God will make us rich with money. We are able to give our offering because of the grace of God. Paul says that God will make grace thrive in you. You'll have what you need, and you'll be plentiful in every good work. Paul takes the holistic view. God will bless us as we bless others. If we fail to meet our offering obligations, we deny ourselves blessings and promises from God. 
Here's a story from a stewardship scrapbook by William R. Philippe. The minister was giving a sermon on total giving. When it came time to take up the offering, the plate came to a pew where there was a very small boy. He looked up at the usher and said, could you lower the plate? Thinking that he wanted to see into the plate, the usher held it down a bit. No, said the boy, a little lower, please. The usher lowered it a bit more. More. Could you just put it on the floor, the boy asked. The usher was aghast, but finally put it on the floor. The boy stepped into it, stood there, and said, this is what I give to the Lord. Jeff mentioned the story of the widow's mite two weeks ago. Both the widow and this little boy understood, and they gave their all to God. They trusted that God would provide them with even more. But it's so hard when we look at our wallets, our checkbook, our savings. It's hard to see how the bills will be paid, how the groceries will be bought. In my case, how the medications will be paid for with what's left in my wallet or checking account. There's the problem. We aren't giving from our hearts. We're giving from our heads. And yes, I'm pointing at myself when I say that. Our reading from chapter 8 of 2 Corinthians tells us that the Macedonian churches gave first to the Lord. That's the idea of first fruits. Giving God a tenth or tithe from what is left at the end of the month isn't what God intended. Yes, the tithe is God's low-end expectation. Remember a minute ago, I said an estimate of Old Testament giving was 22%. The church in Macedonia was a much poorer church than the church in Corinth. The Macedonian churches were in Philippi, Berea, and Thessalonica. They were in the northern part of Greece and in the Roman province of Macedonia. They knew of the famine, war, and persecution, persecution in the Jerusalem churches. The Macedonian churches identified with the situation because they had faced the same things and were still trying to put their apples back in the cart. They were struggling, but they voluntarily gave. They gave accordingly and even beyond. Paul attempts to persuade the Corinthians by showing them that the poor in Macedonia were helping the poor. He uses Macedonian giving as an example of a healthy, gracious offering. These poor churches lived in confidence that what remained would be enough because God would take care of them. Their giving freed them and connected them more relationally to God. It's what gave them the sense of intimacy with God that we all long for. In Paul's eyes, the offering is a necessary good and an integral part of worship. It's still a central part of worship today. The offering was missing from worship whenever we were doing the COVID. And we had our offering plate at the entrances. I felt like I was dropping in my entrance fee. I know, that's my problem to deal with. The church in Corinth had an abundance to share with their brothers and sisters in Christ in Jerusalem. This was a thriving city, both commercially and politically. He wants them to consider where their money is going and, again, to decide if they are being self-centered or looking outwards to others in need. Paul pleads with them to support the poor beyond their community voluntarily and joyfully. This relates to us today as we live in the abundance of our Western civilization, we should give to meet the needs of others. The Corinthian church was initially enthusiastic to give, and Paul's urging them to complete their giving plan. He's not asking for everything they have, but he's asking for balanced stewardship. After all, the church began in Corinth, and in a sense, it's the mother church for all of Paul's missions they should have been setting an example. Paul speaks bluntly. He's not as harsh as Malachi, but he's straightforward. Paul tells the Corinthians to put their money where their mouth is. They said they would give an offering to the church in Jerusalem. Now they need to carry through. Here's another story from Philippi. At a church meeting, a very wealthy man rose to tell the rest of those present about his Christian faith. I am a millionaire, he said, and I attribute all to the rich blessings of God in my life. I remember the turning point in my faith. I had just earned my first dollar, and I went to a church meeting that night. The speaker was a missionary who told about his work. 
I knew that I only had a dollar bill and had to either give it all to God's work or nothing at all. So at that moment, I decided to give my whole dollar, everything I had, to God. I believe that God blessed that decision, and that is why I am a rich man today. He finished, and there was an odd silence at his testimony as he moved toward his seat. As he sat down, a little old lady sitting in the same pew leaned over to him and said, I dare you to do it again. <laughs> it's easy to give our all once. Like the Corinthian church, this wealthy man got lost in what he had and forgot that he had made a commitment to the larger church. We need to be consistent givers. There's a swell in our hearts when we think about giving after 9-11, the Asian tsunami, or Hurricane Katrina, and then, of course, more recent events. We recognize the appeal of special offerings and emergency situations, but they don't replace our steady offering to Level Green Presbyterian Church's ministry. Jeff told us that in his sermon October 10th, and I'm quoting Jeff. I doubt that there is any letter that I can write or sermon that I can give that can persuade you to give more. Only God can do that. Only the Holy Spirit can convict you about what you give to the work of the kingdom of God. Only God can be the source of such gracious giving after a catastrophe. Only God can move us accordingly to give to our church. Paul reminds us that Jesus left heaven and all the riches in heaven for my sake, for your sake. He lived in the home of a simple carpenter. He worked with his hands to earn a living. He never owned any property. And he suffered the humiliation of crucifixion. He did all of that so that we could someday have the riches of heaven. For Christians, generous giving is not a now and then activity. Our stewardship is a daily choice and way of life. Paul reminds the Corinthians and us that life has an odd way of using the same measuring cup we use to give to others when it comes to God's gifts for us. In other words, we reap what we sow. We need to trust that when we give abundantly to God, he will give abundantly to us. I mentioned the Step Up campaign a while ago. In that campaign, there was a slide in the PowerPoint and on each step, it told us how many giving units in this church were at that level. That's what I'm asking today. We should strive to tithe, but we may need to take steps up to the next giving level to get to the tithe. I'm asking what Paul was asking. Prayerfully make a pledge for 2022 that you can joyfully give from your first fruits as you respond to God's grace. And for those of you who still itemize your tax return, remember, what you render unto God is deductible from what you render unto Caesar. Let's pray. Abundant God, you made us in your image and breathed in us a spirit of generosity that is both gift and response. Move us, we pray, to give as we have received, abundantly, generously, and joyfully that our common ministry may always bear witness to your unfailing grace. Amen. And we'll stand to sing our stewardship hymn for this year.
in the words of Paul, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Thank you.